Welcome everybody. My name is Peter Bonieres. I'm the Dean of the College of Computing and Information here at the University. I want to welcome you to the second annual Bunchaft Lecture, graciously endowed by two remarkable individuals, Alan Karen Bunchaft. Al and Karen are both alumni of the University, Al of Computer Science and my former teaching assistant, and Karen of Biology. Al is the Managing Director of Dassault Systems American Organization. Uh, Dassault is a, is a company that provides businesses and people with virtual universes to imagine sustainable innovations. Al was mentioning yesterday, for example, that about 80% of the cars that you see driving around were designed using Dassault Systems. Al and Karen believe that it is critical to bring prominent figures in the fields of computing and information to campus every year, to engage with our students and faculty, give us their perspectives on where the fields are going, and talk about the opportunities that they see, especially for our students who are studying with us today. And I extend a special welcome to the students for coming here this morning. Al and Karen are with us today. Please join me in thanking them for making this wonderful event possible. Al Some of you may remember if you were here last year that Al gave the inaugural lecture last year where he introduced us to his perspective on how to have a career and a life, even if you're not sure what your goals are yet, using his own life as an example. This year promises to be an equally uh, interesting talk. I would now like to introduce our president, Robert Jones. President Jones joined us this past January following a distinguished 34-year career at the University of Minnesota where he held key leadership positions. President Jones describes the University of Albany as a world-class institution of higher education with an innovative research portfolio that serves our nation's highest needs and ensures that New York State is at the forefront of today's technological advances. I'm delighted that you could join us today, President Jones, and meet with some of those former and current U Albany students who keep us at the forefront of today's computing and information technology fields. President Jones. Thank you, Peter, and welcome to everyone. It's great to be here for the second annual Von Schaff Lecture. Since I arrived at the University of Albany on January 2nd, one of the things that is very, very clear to me it's a fact that really, uh, on a recurring basis, almost each and every week, I am reminded of the outstanding alumni that have finished and graduated and continue to be engaged with this great university. Surely, Al and uh, Karen Bunchaff are shining examples of what I'm speaking of. Thank you so much for endowing this very, very special lecture series. Your support provides the university a forum to exchange ideas and views on careers and computing and information sciences. So again, thank you very much. Uh, we have with us today a very, very special and distinguished university alums, uh, Jonathan Rochelle. Let's give Jonathan a round of applause now. And I think we all would agree that both Alan and Jonathan's story shine a light on the strengths of the University of Albany Colleges of Computer and Information and Computer Sciences program. CCI's program equips our students for successful careers in information-rich, data-driven society. You all been involved are working today in some of the world's most prestigious and influential companies. <coughs> One of these extremely influential companies, namely Google, had the good sense to make our speaker, Jonathan Rochelle, a very key member of their team in 2005. A co-founder of the popular Google Docs product, Jonathan is the director of product management for Google's app. Jonathan graduated from New Albany in 1985 with a bachelor's degree in computer science and business administration. He spent the next 16 years as a software engineer and application development manager, primarily at J.P. Morgan and, and company, working across a broad set of financial services businesses. Then he co-founded and built 
and sold two technology startups, not one, but two technology startups. One of those, two web technologies, was acquired by Google. It is responsible for the technology behind the <coughs> spreadsheet, which launched in 2006 as the first component of what became Google Docs. Jonathan is clearly an innovator, and very clearly, Jonathan, you are very proud, we're very proud, that you are an alumnus of the university at Albany. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you the second annual Bunchef Lecturer, Jonathan Rochelle. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's great to be here. And thank you, Al and Karen, again. Um, I was going to call this talk How to Have a Career in a Life, but Al stole that from me last year, unfortunately. <laughs> so I have to rename it. And uh, I also have to unlock my machine. So um, I'm here uh, not really to talk about Google. Um, but I will, I will talk about Google, but I'm here because I was there, you know, I was sitting in your seat. Um, unfortunately, Robert mentioned all the years that I <laughs> graduated ago and uh, how many years I spent working uh, on Wall Street, actually, before I started my startups. Um, but I, I am quite proud that I came from this university, um, you know, I, I always was. And uh, to come back here is really special for me. So to see all the students, I'm actually humbled by you. Um, what you will achieve will likely be greater than any of us did. So um, I call this, you should be innovating. Um, I think generally it's advice. Um, and, and I'll uh, you know, give you advice. I want it to be clear that I don't expect you to follow this advice. I expect you to take it and put it into you know, your toolbox of other things you'll hear. Everybody's going to give you advice, and, and that's just the way it goes. So as Robert said, I'm Jonathan Rochelle. Everybody calls me JR. Feel free to do that. If it feels weird, you can call me Jonathan. Um, but almost everybody knows me as JR. I'm a product manager at Google. Product management, again, I was a CS major here, but product management requires computer science at Google. But if you look at product management as a career, it's got a breadth of things that it can mean. It depends on the company. So never take the title or the organizational name or something as, OK, I know what that job is. At Google, a product manager is an engineer who creates products and then launches them. Um, and that's what I do at Google. I would not, I'll just you know, say, I don't think I would have been equipped to do that from my time at JP Morgan, even though I was mostly doing some of that. I was really managing engineers at some point. I was a programmer, loved programming, and still love it. Um, but then when I did my startups, that's what really gave me, I think, the tools to become a product manager at Google. I'm an entrepreneur. I started two companies. One of the companies, as Robert said, was bought by Google. Um, that's what you know, really brought me there. Uh, SUNY Albany alum, obviously. Uh, tech geek is probably the best way that my family would describe me. Um, I consider myself a creator. I love anything creative. And I think that's something that really underscores most of what I talk about today, is creativity. And um, for better or for worse, I'm an optimist. I, I love so many ideas. And, and I always think positive, And I think that also underlies uh, innovation. And I'm a, I'm a person. I'm a father, a husband, brother, son, uncle. Um, and that actually is an important part of uh, what you guys are, too, and what you'll become. So what is innovation? We'll just start there, very simple. Innovation is creation. It's the creation of an original solution to some problem. Right? It's very simplistic. Um, it's not something I pulled out of Wikipedia. Uh, it's just something I, I, that's how I see innovation. It's just an original solution. And it, you, know, you can consider it cognitive, creative problem solving. You're taking a problem, you're solving it in a way that you're using your mind, your brain. You're using other things too, but you're using your mind to create that, that solution. But why innovate? You know, why do you have to innovate to solve that problem? It's because not every problem has a right answer. So we grow up in school, and I just recently did a talk at our local high school um, to try to get teachers motivated to teaching different things and not just worrying about standardized testing. Standardized testing likely is the opposite of teaching kids to innovate. You're picking an answer out of four or five potentially correct answers. That is not how you learn to innovate. And I'm not saying standardized testing is the wrong thing to do. What I'm saying is it, it must be, you must add on to it. You must add to that. 
So innovation is is not only um, letting you find the you know the not the answer that wasn't found before the the new answer the creative solution, but it's empowering. It equalizes anybody can do it. It can potentially change the world, and it's fun. It's interesting. It's motivating. And life is unpredictable. That is the most important part. Right? You don't know what you're going to face. So those skills that you learn in, innovate, uh, in innovation, it doesn't mean, oh, I'm just going to use that to create the next technology product or other product. It, it, it's going to help you solve problems in life. They're skills that are useful no matter what. So we don't learn by memorizing the answers. We learn by trying many answers. You try many things. And not by fearing to fail and avoiding it. That's the other thing we learn in school, right? Don't fail. I'm going to teach you <laughs> that I think failure is actually important. But that doesn't mean everybody should go fail, I know. Robert's thinking, don't say that. And we're going to start getting, seeing Fs across the board. Jonathan Rochelle, that guy that came here, said it's OK. But, but failing and learning from it, that's, that's how we learn to do it. Not staying in our comfort zone, but getting out of our comfort zone and doing things we've never done before. If you don't do that, you won't ever know where your skills lie, potentially. And not by following the rules, but by making the rules. If you don't, you know, I, I actually, somebody asked me at the school, uh, the high school talk I did, so how do you get your kids to innovate? I have three children, fairly small children, 12, 9, and 6. How do you teach that in your, and instill that in your children? And one of the ways I do it is we make up games. We don't just pull out a game. We love to pull out games, too, and, and play uh, Candyland. It happens to be. Um, not a very innovative game, though. <laughs> you just move along the board. You know, the only innovative thing is how you cheat, maybe. Um, but, but by making the rules and making up games, that's how my kids, you know, they love doing that now. My six-year-old comes to me with games. She, made it. she wrote an instruction book for a new game. It was amazing. I don't know if it made sense, but it was amazing. <laughs> Um, and not, not simply planning to build something, not saying, well, here's what, I, what, you know, what, I, what we could build and putting it on paper. You know, that's actually important to do that in the step, but you have to actually build something. So you learn by doing, and you learn how to innovate by doing. And that's why engineering is important. Engineering is building. It's one of those things that help us build. And so this, these, this is like the inventory of skills that I feel, it's not the only set of skills, but it's skills that I feel are important in innovating. Right? Creativity foremost, I see that as the foundation of innovation. Optimism and passion, decisiveness, having an opinion, experimenting, accepting failure, that's the other thing. Researching, of course, you need to gather information. Collaboration, creation, and that creation step Starting with creativity and then actual creation. That's engineering, design, carpentry. It's anything, anything that lets you create. So, you know, I call this talk, you should. I, you know, I, I want to be clear. I, there is no formula to innovation. I don't think anybody should walk away saying, oh, you know, Jay thinks actually he knows how to innovate and he, he tried to teach us, you know, oh, can I have those slides because those slides will show me how to innovate. I know you know that's not true. There is no formula. That said, I'm going to give you advice. That's what I'm going to actually run through, is those skills and some ideas that you can take, not follow. I want to start with a, uh, with a video, and just to, to sort of get the, um, uh, the feeling of innovation across. And I will warn you that we may have a technology problem here. So. Uh, The actual moonshot is wonderful, inspirational, poetic, beautiful, involved, great technical challenges, genuine heroism. It brought the world together. But think about the Polynesian Islander on the dugout canoe, deciding one day they were gonna go that way. No one had ever been that way before. No one even knew if there was anything that way before. It was amazing, and it changed the world. People can set their minds to magical, seemingly impossible ideas, and then through science and technology, bring them to reality. And that then sets other people on fire, that other things that look impossible might be accomplishable. Galileo is such a hero, you know, in thinking big, and what he represents to me is both curiosity and wonder that humanity had, that he had, that pushed him and drove himself to invent and work on the first telescopes that allowed us to see the moon, and here we are. These aviation pioneers were, were figuring it out as they went. No one really knew how to build an airplane, right? No one knew how to fly an airplane. It was amazing and crazy and wonderful, and they wanted to explore. Many years ago, the great British explorer George Mallory, who was to die 
on Mount Everest was asked why did he want to climb it. He said because it is there. There's so many challenges in the world and you can feel daunted by that, you know, and sort of oppressed by that. Or you kind of say, how might we think differently about this? Everyone else in the world is working on the next 10%. If you can be the one that delivers that 10 times improvement, you have a chance to really change things. If you want cars to run at 50 miles per gallon, fine, you can retool your car a little bit. But if I tell you it has to run on a gallon of gas for 500 miles, you have to start over. You need a lot of courage in this work and you need a lot of persistence. One of the things that's really critical is not only having the courage to keep trying every day or thinking big, even if you don't really 100% believe it's possible, like you might think this might be possible. Have the courage to try. That's how the greatest things have happened. You don't spend your time being bothered that you can't teleport from here to Japan because there's a part of you that thinks it's impossible. Moonshot thinking is choosing to be bothered by that. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Humanity's progress has been a series of amazing, audacious things from the very small and personal up to the great, big and grand, and we are a species of moonshots. And to me, that's like the really amazing, poetic and inspirational thing. I think our ambitions are a glass ceiling on what we can accomplish. When you find your passion, you're unstoppable. You can make amazing things happen. It's been true through all of history. I believe in the human spirit, and I believe that there are always going to be crazy people who will get out of bed one morning and say, you know what, I think I can build a space elevator, and let's go and do it. But I think that if we become afraid to take these great big risks, we stop inspiring people. We stop achieving things. And the biggest nightmare scenario is that we won't have what it takes to solve the really big challenges. When Kennedy said that we would put a man on the moon, it's about the fact that he said, we don't know how to do this yet, and we're going to do it anyway. And that sends chills up everybody's spine. Because if that happens, what couldn't we do? So the important points that I see there, right? 10x, not 10%. We talk about improvement, and I have to say I learned a lot about um, small step improvement in, on Wall Street. That was, that was uh, what we typically did. Okay, it's cost cutting year. How do we shave 10% off costs? We're trying to boost revenue by 15%, 20%, 10x. It's very different, right? It's, it's completely rethink everything. And you, know, you, you might watch this and say, fine, moonshot, right? I'm, I'm going to be the next you know, moonshot guy, right? It's like, yeah, right. Where did those guys start? You know, where did they, where did they start? I don't, you know, you, you never know where you're going to go. So let's start with all the, what I call the bees. Um, so the, the, be creative. Art, music, science. Uh, I like to use actually um, sandcastles and snowmen even are good examples of being creative. And, and the sandcastles and snowman analogy, I think, is one of the best to also start accepting failure quickly, right? What happens to those? They melt, they get washed away. The first time that happens to my kids, they're crying, literally. We built something awesome in their eyes, and it gets washed away. And that's like, actually, to me, that's a beautiful thing because we're just gonna build another one. And we're gonna take what we learned from that first one and build it a little bit again, but it'll never be the same. It'll probably be better. Sometimes it isn't, but those are great teeny little lessons that actually teach kids it's okay to fail. You must try, right? That last line, I love that line, which is, it's, a, it's about saying you're going to do something without having any idea about how. You're going to achieve this without any idea about how. I actually remember, I was, uh, somebody was asking me, how did you get into computer science? How did you, when did you know, right? People with kids usually ask me that. My kids don't know yet. When did you know you were gonna go into computer science? I, I knew in 11th grade I took one computer class and literally, I would say within the first five hours of class time, you know, over five days, I was absolutely positive I was A, going to go into computer science, B, I had a direction because I had no direction before then. Average student with potential. 
Um, and it was a little, you can relate to that, I bet. And uh, it was a little um, daunting to think, well, what, what am I going to do? I have no idea. But when I took that first computer class, I had a passion for it. I, I loved the fact that I could tell the computer what to do and it would do it. Maybe that was, maybe that's the, the problem. Um, is, uh, but I think that that's actually, you know, it's really important, that ambitious thinking. I'll never forget one of my first thoughts in that class. Is I never even thought to say this. It, it just struck me is that when I learned that computers were based on a bit flip, ones and zeros, I thought that is the stupidest thing in the world. I'm going to be the guy who makes that not true. I'm going to make the multi-bit, you know, the multi-state thing. I'm not that guy. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure anybody. I didn't understand even why that was so critical to the whole foundation of computer science, but I wanted to challenge it. And uh, I, I'm, I'm shocked that I actually uh, just remembered that. But I lost my screen now, sorry. The other unfortunate thing about corporate life, even at Google, is safety. So, um, so my, my view is creativity is the foundation right, of, of innovation. I add be a programmer in there, because coding to me is art. It's functional art. It's art that works. And I, I think that's what drew me to it. I, I'm, not a, I'm not a good artist or an artist, really. I love to draw, and sometimes somebody will say, oh, that's actually pretty good, you know, but I'm nowhere near an artist. But I think what drew me to, com to computer science and programming was that I could create something 100% unique, nobody ever created it. Um, whether it's useless or not doesn't matter, but it's like art, and it works. It actually does something, and that's really exciting. I think that's what draws people to some of the physical art when they put something, you know, sculpture, and things that feel real, they're, they're physical. But with, with coding, it works. So if you're creative, right, and you, and you get a sense of what programming can do, you, it opens a whole new world. Being passionate, I actually feel, is a critical element of being innovative. If you're not excited to, quote, go to work each day or to do what you do each day, if it doesn't excite you, you're not going to do something great. It's not likely you're going to have an achievement that people look at and say, wow, that's amazing, or that you'll even feel that good about. So find something, right? You have to do, there are some things you need to do, right? Maybe the standardized testing fits in that. Um, and, but, but you should do what you love and find your passion. And I think it was Megan Smith in that uh, video. Um, and I was saying Megan Smith is actually one of the people that was responsible for bringing my company into Google. And now she works in Google X, the, uh, the organization that does some very ambitious things. And I think she said in that video, pa when, you, when you find your passion, you're unstoppable. And that's really almost a necessity. I think it's a, nece a necessary ingredient to being unstoppable. At Google, we have something called 20% time. And I include it here because that's the whole point. 20% time basically gives engineers the ability to work on pretty much anything they want one day a week. 20% of your time is one day a week. That's a lot of time. Most companies would say that's absurd. But we actually see that as something that creates breakthroughs for us. Gmail is one of those things that was created in 20% time. There was one guy who actually felt very passionate that mail is seriously broken. And so he created Gmail, started showing it to people, people's eyebrows started going up, and then suddenly he had a team and he built it and it was launched in 2004 as one of the very large achievements in you know, browser-based apps. So that's an example and there's so many others. But 20% time, it's something that actually, um, you know, I think we could actually try in education, we could try it in other places, and certainly other companies are starting to uh, do that as well. Being decisive. People ask me about product management and even generally, what skills do I need to, you know, what's the most important skill? And I thought about it a lot, and we spoke about it a little bit last night, and I, and I think one of the things, you know, besides obviously creativity and the ability to experiment and other things, I actually think making decisions is one of the hardest things to learn. Because you sometimes, you're faced with something that feels like there's a wrong way and a right way, and I don't know which is which. And that is a really uncomfortable feeling. It goes back to the idea that you have to be comfortable failing. But that's why you make a decision. You just make it. Because sometimes that's actually more important than making the right decision. And I can't tell you how many times a day, but certainly a week, that I'm faced with a decision that I think really, I call these the 50-50s. I don't know the answer. And when somebody asks me, why did you make that decision? All I can do is say, here's the data I had. If you think you feel like one of them even leans 60 or 70% to the right, you know, the correct way, let's do it. I don't feel that. I think we're 50-50, so I'm going this way with my intuition, my experience, my, my gut. 
And it's more important to make that decision, right? That's actually critical because you don't know if you're right. You can always turn back if you have to, right? Maybe not always, but usually you can turn back. But if you make the decision faster, you'll get to that right answer faster. Be opinionated, you know, make, make an opinion, form an opinion. Do all the things you need to do to form that opinion. It's something that actually our leadership, um, the person that for, for me runs Chrome and apps, um, and now Android, he actually feels very strongly about product management especially. Be opinionated, take a stand, and have beliefs. Base them on experience and data, that's actually pretty important. But recognize when there are challenges, incredible challenges, and, and recalibrate if you have to, but, but take a position. Be curious, obviously, research things, learn what others have learned. Use that as your foundation. That's why I feel like what you people will achieve, you, the students here, you're standing on the shoulders of everything that came before you. I can't even imagine having in my hands the technology you have in your hands or the tools or the wisdom now that you can move on from. I, in my freshman year, used punch cards. <laughs> I used punch cards to, to create computer programs, paper to computer program. That's just insane. And, and, it's, um, and it's just wonderful that you can do that, but you have to actually sometimes consciously do it and say, I'm not going to reinvent this. It was done. And that's what's so beautiful about open source, for those of you that use it, right? It's, you, you are standing on the shoulders of giants. Be a scientist. And this is probably, again, I, besides creativity, I really feel like this is the most, most critical thing to learn and to do. Experiment. You've got to always try things. Just get into it and start and experiment. Try things and then measure the results and try it again and iterate. Learn from it and do it over. I show here, actually, this is the one time I plug my kids. My three kids at the science fair. The science fair is teaching them from kindergarten to experiment and to fail. My son, my nine-year-old, they have this thing where you, um, you know, get awards or whatever. They created an award for him, I'm pretty sure, because he was willing to admit failure. He see, you know, they, they asked him, so did you, did you achieve what you were trying to achieve? No, we had to change the experiment completely. Like, we totally redid it. We had to undo what we did. And, and I think they were just impressed with the fact that he was gracefully accepting the fact that, yeah, I set out to do this, it didn't really work. It didn't work at all. So we tried something else, and that sort of worked. It got us some results. It wasn't that clear, but it was good enough. And he learned something from it, and it was exciting, and, and they really recognized that. So experimenting teaches you to take risks, to make decisions, like I said, to really accept failure, and to say, I made that decision. I'm taking the stand. I'm be taking, you know, I have an opinion, and we're going to go that way. Oh my god, we failed. Let's, let's go back. So. Experimenting is a necessary ingredient, right, for achievement. You have to do that. If you don't experiment, I'm sure you basically have an expectation for perfection because you're afraid to fail, right? You're not experimenting because you, you, you don't think it's going to succeed. I don't think it's, it's going to work. So you're going to basically accept the status quo because you're saying, well, since I might fail, I'm not going to experiment, which means I'll never achieve anything. I'll never really get forward. Being ambitious. I, one of the, I, I think it's actually one of the... Um, Again, a really powerful just soundbite from that video. Our ambition is the glass ceiling. In other words, our ambitions aren't high enough. We think, I'm ambitious, I can achieve this. No, you can achieve this. You can go 10x. Don't be ambitious to 10%. Think way, way up. And it's almost, sometimes it's impossible to do it because some of these things are unimaginable. So the two examples I give here, you know, again, these are just two examples, and it's certainly nowhere near a moonshot, um, but, but maybe one day it'll be considered that. Self-driving cars, right? Google Glass, some of you saw me wearing it yesterday. Um, it's fun, but you know, really what's important is it might be a step to something better. That's actually what's really important. And, and there were several steps before that, you know, that were really important. We were talking about it yesterday. You know, the first time you saw somebody wearing Bluetooth, right? A Bluetooth thing in their ear. You probably thought they were insane because they were talking to themselves, hand motions and everything. And, and now that's just, you know, it's part of what people do. You kind of accept it. Maybe the first time you saw people wearing even the white uh, iPod, you know, headphones. It's like, oh, wow, that person's making a fashion statement. And now they're listening to music and they're, and they're making a fashion statement. But the idea of self-driving cars, I think, is actually quite game-changing and potentially world-changing and actually life-saving, right? This is something that is apparently at least in early studies, safer than us. It makes sense, right? You can't distract a computer. You can have bugs, and that's scary. But you can't really distract it if it's not programmed for distraction. 
Um, so these things are really important, and aiming high and being ambitious is what really what, and that's, that's Sergey Brin actually. He runs Google X. Um, the people that were in that video, I think, I think all of them, most of them are in, in Google X. Being a failure. So if you're not failing, you're not experimenting but you want to fail fast. And that's the idea also of being a failure, is, is that will teach you to cycle, iterate, try it again. And if, you don't, if you're not willing to fail, you might not get there fast enough. But you'll gain insight and you'll succeed sooner the faster you fail. And being honest. This is actually one of the, just these human traits that's just so hard to avoid, right? It's, it's, it's a little bit of ego. Um, and, and, and really, you're, you want so badly to be accepted. You have to be honest about failure. If you fail, the best thing you can do is to say, I failed, and this is what I learned. A, I don't want you going there. And B, let's go the next step. Let's do the next thing, and let's avoid that again. So you're with yourself, with your team, about the results, about the failure, and then be open. Share everything you've learned. Let the next person get further. That's actually probably the most important thing. You went this path, you found danger, tell the person. Don't go that way, right? Bridge closed, go that way. That's the important part. And at Google, the collection and sharing of information, it's one of the most open environments I've ever worked in in my life. And it was enlightening because we were not like that at JP Morgan and at other uh, companies that I worked for. It was very closed and very um, secretive. Not, not to be, not you know, in, on purpose, not to, to be evil. It was more because that's what they felt was important, was keep the information you know, uh, behind walls. At Google, we tried really hard internally. I'll never forget my first day I joined, I learned things about the Google search engine that I felt like, oh my God, they just told me too much. I just learned too much. This is my first day here. Like, how could they do that? Let's say I leave tomorrow. Now I know this. Well, there's trust and there's a, you know, kind of a, a, an acceptance that people will you know, have loyalty and they'll have integrity. Um, and we still have that at Google. The culture of open sharing is amazing. Every um, quarter, the chairman actually stands up in front of all Googlers and talks about what he told the board that quarter and shares with us the board presentation. And he goes through it step by step. And the only thing he doesn't share are the financial numbers that he's not allowed to legally. And, he, and every time he says, listen, if somebody leaks this, you're threatening this open environment for all of us. Don't do that. And typically, it doesn't happen, right? Every once in a while, we have leaks. I'm sure you guys have read some of them if you follow things like the Google System blog or some of these things. But, but there's a culture of openness and, and, and trust. And that gives every single person on the team the power of the whole team. It's as if every person could stand alone because they represent the entire team. Did we lose audio? Can you guys hear me in the back anyway? I'm, I'm really a loud mouth, so. Be a team. And this is something that's actually hard to learn if you're not working on team projects. Work on team projects at school as much as you can, even if it's a little painful, which it always is. Um, do it. Working as a team is so critical. Um, and you want to build the team, motivate the team. I don't know if any of you read the Forbes article recently. It was very focused on, it was in, uh, interviewing um, Laszlo Bach, who is the head of HR, basically. <laughs> now we're too loud. It's the head of HR. <laughs> <laughs> He's the head of HR. Uh, and he was talking to Forbes about how we motivate people, how we keep them happy. You know, yes, every 150 yards, I'll find food. Yay, food. And, it's, uh, and it actually works. It's really good. I love going to work. I actually love being there. I love being at work. But it's crazy, right? I mean, that's really insane. And that, there's a reason why all the startups, right, in Silicon Valley, in New York, in Albany, in Boston, why they're taking that as well. They're doing that. We didn't invent that. But we, but we really took to it. We really said, this is really important to give people food, no, to keep people happy. Um, it's really actually, it, it really works. It, uh, it, it keeps people motivated and they, you know, all kinds of crazy things that keep us happy at work. And being aligned. If you've got a team, you want the team basically, um, not necessarily facing the same direction, but aiming towards the same goal, right? We do something called setting objectives and key results every quarter. And objectives and key results, OKRs, again, we didn't invent this, but Sergey and Larry, from the first days that they started the company, started setting quarterly objectives for the, each person, each team, and for the company as a whole. And we measure them every quarter, and we accept failure, and we talk about it, and we are constantly doing that, always saying, where are we all going? 
and it's incredibly critical. It's so important. The plan, how you're going to get there, can be a little more flexible, right? You can you can make adjustments, but if you're not facing towards the same goal, it's uh, it's dangerous. And and you want to be an analyst. You want to get the data. You want to analyze the data, look at it, right? You want to study it. See, look, you look for things in, and I'm saying the data pretty loosely. It depends what you're doing. But information is critical, right? So whenever possible, you don't want to have to think. You want to know. So if somebody asked me, I said, be opinionated, that's fine. But it's better to have an opinion based on data than an opinion just based on gut. Intuition and gut usually um, you know, is something that you rely on when you don't have the data. Sometimes you'll go against the data. If your intuition is really strong and you're saying the data might say something, I think it's something else, that sometimes works. And there's, it's fairly easy to find examples of that. But when somebody says to me on my team, I think I immediately kind of recoil and say, okay, let me hear what he thinks. And then I'll tell him that I don't really care what he thinks if he can know, right? <laughs> so if we say, how many people use that um, research tool under the tools menu? I think it's pretty widely used. I talked to a guy that was using it. And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let me know next week when you have the data and we'll talk more about that. But, it's, um, but I'm, I'm guilty of that too. I, I, uh, I consider myself a smart product manager. I know, I know what my customers want, right? I, I, and I do see my customers. I go to schools, I go to companies, I see my family using it and friends. And, and, and it's really hard with products that you use yourself and that you see because you, you really bend towards your intuition and, what you, and the slice you see. But if you don't gather from 1,000 or 10,000 or 10 million users, really the, the graph, and say, well, how are people generally using it? Wow, only 10% of the people even know we have that feature. Is that good? Is that bad? I don't know. Let's look at the other features. There's so much you can do to know the answer, not to think. And being a carpenter, I like using this as an example because A, carpentry is creative. I love doing carpentry. I haven't done it in a while, but I love making things out of wood. It's sort of like the balance between software and hardware. It's soft enough where if I make a mistake, I can start over. It costs a little bit of money, but it's, but it's hardware. You can, you can really see it and feel it and sit on it or put a TV on it. Um, but you can also make it in cardboard first, and that's a good, I think, the way carpenters work. My father-in-law is a brilliant carpenter, and he does that all the time, and he looks at us like we're crazy if we don't do it. It's like, well, you know, we're thinking of a table here or whatever. He immediately goes to the basement, looks for cardboard, starts taping it together, and makes the size. He's like, like this? And it's like, oh, wow, no, that's too big. I was wrong. We were wrong. That's the wrong thing. And you can do things like that in software and in engineering and hardware in all kinds of things. But I think carpenters have it right. They also do another thing. Um, and, and, you know, uh, uh, the, the idea of measuring twice, right, and cutting once, that's the way to save money. You know, and every single time I measure the second time, it is different. So it proves me right. It's like I measure it once, I walk away, and I'm thinking, uh, measure it twice. And I go back, and I'm like, oh, my God, thank God I did that. Um, but they also make things to make things. They make templates. You know, did you ever see a carpenter put in door hinges? Door hinges are really hard, really hard. But it's a pretty rote job. And then when you go to do it yourself, you're like, oh my God, this is the hardest thing I've ever done. It looks so easy. It's just a hinge on a door that hangs. Well, it's super hard. But when you do it right once for one door, they make these templates that now you just, you know, for cabinets or something, put the template against the next door and you go zip, zip, zip. Next door, zip, zip, zip. And, and making things to make things, templates and things that, tools that help you scale. And this is what we try really hard to do in software at Google and, and other software companies too. I just talk about Google because that's what I know. But um, I was saying yesterday, game companies that do this are incredibly successful at making games with some pattern because they have reusable components. And be an optimist. Try really hard not to be that guy that says, oh, that'll never work. That is so ridiculous. Don't do that. You can be that guy once you have the data, but don't shoot down the idea that the next guy came up with or even your own idea too soon. Think it'll work, right? Jump out of that plane. <laughs> this chute might open. Uh, <laughs> So when you get ideas, encourage them. I used to be actually criticized a lot for loving every idea. Oh, you love every idea. And I'm like, no, I actually don't. I encourage every idea, right? That's, I, I, but, and, but I did learn to set a higher bar, actually, to not encourage people down a bad path. Because I, I did find that I would be so encouraging. People would be like, oh my god, that's an awesome idea. And they go, do it. Other, they find out, well, that's not such a great idea. I wonder why JR loved it so much. 
And you know, when they would ask me, I'm like, well, I mean, I loved it. I didn't love it that much. <laughs> but, so I realized that I had to set the high bar, and even in my expression of how much I love it, so I, I focus more on encouraging and only love the best ones, and really pick those that you love. If you, and always you know, use this as a test, and if you see 10 things, if you had to pick one, is that the one you'd pick? And we do that all the time with prioritization. The hardest job of a product manager, actually, is to decide what to do next. You have limited resources. We don't, believe it or not, at Google, we don't have unlimited engineers or resources. We have very limited resources. And one of the things Sergey used to love to say to us is, scarcity brings clarity. If I give you one engineer, you're going to decide the right thing to do. If I give you 100, you're going to do all kinds of stuff. I don't want you doing all kinds of stuff. Pick the right thing. And that's actually critical. And I think it starts at the idea stage. This one is counterintuitive. Be stupid. Again, Robert's looking at me like, oh my god. <laughs> How did we invite this guy? <laughs> Being stupid, and I, I steal this. <laughs> I steal this from, um, from the Diesel brand. I don't know if you guys know Diesel Jeans. They had this whole campaign in the New, in the New York sub subway system, actually. I walked through the 14th Street Station once looking at each of these posters in awe. They were so good. Some of them were totally inappropriate, but some of them were not and, and really good. The idea is stupid might fail, smart doesn't even try. Right? Smart says that is really not going to work. I wouldn't even try that. Whereas the person who's naive, and I say stupid obviously tongue in cheek, the person who's naive in that specific area might try something that is actually quite innovative and quite new and, and, and groundbreaking. Right? So instead of critiquing because you're smarter, let the person that is stupid create, or be that stupid person and create. <clears throat> Bottled water. That is so stupid, <laughs> right? It's one of the biggest commercial successes. Now, yeah, sure, it created this plastic bottle problem, but the, imagine the first guy who said, I have an idea. <laughs> And didn't they discover that one of the bottles, I won't mention the brand, I might be drinking it, one of the bottles actually just came out of the New York City subway, I mean New York City tap water because it was so good. They were like, this actually is pretty good, let's put it in a bottle and sell it. And it worked until they found out that's all they were doing. And they said, oh, okay, well, if you say you're doing that, that's fine. But if you say it comes from the mountains of Finland, sorry, uh, the FTC doesn't like that. So, um, so being stupid actually has some proof points, right? I think bottled water is one of the best. There's another one, right? One more. Um, people found that they really loved ripped jeans. <laughs> Let's rip them first! It's so stupid. <laughs> it's just amazing. Most expensive jeans on the market, I think. Be focused. There's so many things you can do. Another, uh, I think, um, thing I'm criticized for, lack of focus. I have so many things I want to do. Um, but if you invest more in fewer things, and this was a famous line that Larry Page said when he took over as CEO. Um, and unfortunately, you know, we feel if you're the user of something that is one of those fewer things, you know, or one of the things outside the fewer things we're going to focus on, and, and we're not doing it anymore, but it was cool. Um, it's unfortunate, but it's actually smart. It's really smart to say, yeah, that, that was good. You know, it, it was okay for its time, but we have too many things going on. Let's invest more in the things that are really important and game-changing and world-changing. So more wood behind fewer arrows was the, was the line. Be lucky. This is the one everybody says, well, weren't you just lucky with your, because, you know, the idea that I, I started a company and sold it to Google, you know, it sounds like, oh, my God, you did that, and you're so lucky. And that is absolutely right. I was so lucky. It really, it was, a, it was a, a whole lot of luck. That is important though to understand, right? So you're in the right place at the right time. And we know so many things that happen. It's the right product at the wrong time. There's so many things. When you think in history about products that came out, you know, you look back on the um, Palm Pilot. I had a Palm Pilot. I was in love with it. And it. But it wasn't necessarily the breakthrough, right? But when you look at it, really, that was, a, that was a great product. Wrong time, maybe. Maybe wrong technology, and that's why it was the wrong time. It wasn't advanced enough or something. It was a Newton, right? The Newton is maybe the precursor to the iPad. Um, so the right place at the right time, but then there's right feature, the right partner, all these things that create luck. The right marketing, you just happen to hit the right marketing, the technology that you got, the strategy, the team, all those things create luck, right? So my point is, you can't control luck. You can't say, be lucky to someone and, oh, OK, I'll be lucky. What a, oh my god, how come I didn't see that? You're brilliant. <laughs> be lucky. No, but you can create the opportunities to get lucky. 
And what are those opportunities? What is that? You know, what, what makes the opportunity to get lucky? In my case, I would say it's the typical opportunity for getting lucky, and that is meeting people and talking to people and getting to know them, getting them to like you and if you like them. Right? And making sure that the next time that you talk to them is a good experience, that they're willing to call you and you'll call them. And because those are the people that are your luck. They're your opportunity. Those are the people that have your next job or that you might hire next or that have the right idea that they'll introduce to you. In our case, I'll just give you the snippet, is we were developing Excel to Web as an idea first at JP Morgan. It was a concept. It wasn't Excel to Web, but it was a concept of taking a spreadsheet and turning it into something in an automated way. And that something was a web app, something that you can distribute and show people. You take a spreadsheet with a very complex model. If you handed it to a Java coder and said, put this on the web for me, again, especially back in 2000, put this on the web, they'd be like, oh my god, what does this thing do? Because you know, spreadsheets, right? Very complex models inside them is possible. So, and these traders were doing, these are quants with PhDs that are creating unbelievable logic inside a spreadsheet. The estimate would always come back, and I, and I had programmers on my team that were doing this. Estimate would come back six months. And the trader would look at us like he wanted to throttle us. <laughs> it took me about a week to write that model, and it's gonna take you six months to get it on the web? Forget it. Like, never mind. I'll just send the model and all my intellectual property over to the customer. And, uh, and so we came up with the idea, my partner came up with the idea, the, my co-founder, to take that Excel spreadsheet and convert it into something automated into a web app. And literally, the person would push a button and it would convert it into a web app. And it was amazing. It was quite amazing. And that's, that was kind of the insight. But we had technology that wasn't that good. The way we were doing it was totally different. We contacted a guy that we knew that was apparently the father of XML. He was the guy that knew XML. We said, What's, what architecture should we use here? He worked at BEA at the time, BEA Software at the time. And he gave us some advice, whatever. And years passed. I went off to do my consulting company. That was the, one of the two companies that I started. Then my partner, whose name happens to be Fuzzy, joined me to start up the second company, uh, Two Web Technologies. And we were going after this idea. We're going to make it better. And as we got to what we thought was the right answer from some of the advice we got from this guy, Adam, um, we called Adam again and said, hey, you know, remember you saw this thing? And he's, he's like, oh yeah, that's right, that was really cool. Did you ever fix it, you know? And uh, we said, yeah, we'd love to show it to you and we have some more questions because you, you, know, you gave us some good advice. He's like, well, I'm not at BEA anymore, I'm at Google. All right, can we come see you at Google? Sure, we go to see him at Google and his first words were, just want to make clear that you're here to talk to me, right, not to Google. Like, we're like, yeah, no, we need advice, A, on uh, startup stuff, funding, you know, we know you've done startups, and B, the technology, he's like, fine. Long story short, he looks at the product and pulls the machine away from my co-founder to say, I gotta try this, I, I, I don't understand how, how you're doing this. He tries some really complex spreadsheet logic on this prototype of a spreadsheet web app, and it works. And he says, immediately, I changed my mind. Google's interested in this. And he had the vision to say, this is something that we agree with you. Spreadsheets will go on the web. We want, we want you to do that here. And we thought, oh my god. Like high-fiving out the door. And it struck me. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not very, you know, uh, this, is, this was not like, oh, premeditated. Oh, yeah, I'll do that again. You know, it was, there was a lot of luck in that. The, we found the guy that had a vision that nobody else at Google really was thinking about, that, as far as I know. I was saying, to some of the people yesterday, I would run into people in the halls and I'd be like, why are you doing this? Spreadsheets? Are you going to compete with Excel? What are you doing? Why is Google doing this? And that was, you know, until they started using it. And then when they started using it, it's like, oh, I see. This is actually different. This is not just a, a competition on the web. I always know when I'm talking too much if my machine dies. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm going to end in two minutes. So, so create those opportunities, meet those people. If I didn't meet Adam the first time, we wouldn't have met him the second time. That was the only way it happened. That was it. And be nice. <laughs> Get people to like you. If you can't be nice, be funded. <laughs> if, you've got, if you've got deep pockets, don't worry about being nice. No, I'm only kidding. You should always be nice. I'm a parent now, I have to say that. But it's that, that thing right there, that's a small world, right? It's a small world. The more people like working with you, the more they will, right? It really is something that, uh, it, it makes a difference, trust me. It makes a big difference. Be humble and be nice and get people to want to work with you, it'll work. 
So you should. You should create, experiment, fail. You should do all those things, learn from it, and innovate. Please. Thank you.